Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm Ursula Vogler, MTC and ABAG public engagement staff, and I'm happy to kick off today's webinar, Understanding Urban Sim 2.0 and How It Integrates Baseline Data and Adopted Strategies. I'm joined by Mike Riley, Principal Planner of Land Use Modeling, who will be giving the presentation today, along with Dave Vaughton, Planberry 2050 Project Manager. Before I turn it over to Dave for him to kick things off, I wanted to let you know that we will be taking questions via the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. We will be addressing the questions at the end of the presentation. If you're unable to type questions, you can raise your hand and I will call on you after we answer all questions in the Q&A box. We will be posting the recording of this webinar and the PowerPoint presented today on the Plan Bay Area website at planbayarea.org under meetings and events, past events. Look for that in the next day or so. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Dave. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, as Ursula mentioned, I'm Dave Vaughton with MTC ABAG. Um, and ask that we go to the next slide here. So I'm pleased to welcome everyone to the webinar today. Before I turn it over to Mike, who will be delving into a technical presentation on how Urban Sim 2.0 works, just wanted to set a little bit of context for the presentation today. So as you're all aware, uh, the webinar is really focused on one of our key modeling tools known as Bay Area Urban Sim 2.0. It's a regional land use model that we use to simulate how public policies might affect future regional growth patterns. In the past, we, past months, we've uh, had a webinar on the Bay Area Spatial Information System, that's known as BASIS, uh, which generated a lot of the key baseline land use data that feeds into UrbanSim. We've also been presenting the Blueprint Strategies for Plan Bay Area 2050, which are a set of public policies that are also key inputs to the urban sim modeling process. With both of those data sets ready to go, we're now doing analysis on the final blueprint for Plan Bay Area 2050. And it's really important to remember that that modeling process uses urban sim to look at the future land use pattern, but it also iterates with several other models, including Travel Model 1.5, which does transportation modeling, as well as our REMI model that we use to, to identify economic trends into the future. Next slide. Now, I know that some of you may be technical folks on today's call, others might be uh, members of the public or more policy oriented. So we want to just give a little bit of context of why something like Urban Sim 2.0 is important to discuss and share. Oftentimes modeling can seem like a bit of a black box. Uh, models are complex, uh, they're developed over the course of many years, but they can often provide really useful insights for planners and policymakers. So we use uh, Bay Area Urban Sim 2.0 to help create our long range plan, uh, Plan Bay Area 2050, which looks at transportation, housing, the economy and the environment. And it's really all about exploring how future public policies could affect the regional growth pattern. That growth pattern for the plan on the county and sub-county levels is submitted to the state of California to help us meet the requirements of Senate Bill 375 showing how we can make progress towards key regional goals related to climate, equity, and other key considerations. And importantly, that Plan Bay Area 2050 growth pattern uh, is being considered as a potential input to the Cycle 6 RENA methodology or re regional housing need allocation process. And to do that, we produce some special RENA specific exports on the jurisdictional level as well. So that's how Urban Sim plays a role in both of these key regional planning processes along with other models and other key inputs. Next slide. Mike is gonna go into more detail on uh, how urban sim fits into the puzzle, but I just wanted to sit, uh, have the big picture here to start with. Whenever we're doing forecasting for a long range plan, perhaps, we start off with a regional growth forecast of housing and jobs. This comes from the Remy economic model. So this is outside of the urban sim process, but it's an essential input to it. We also take current data on persons, buildings, and existing land use policies. And if you want to learn more about how we went through that process, you can check out the webinar on the BASIS initiative um, from earlier in the Plan Bay Area 2050 process. And we integrate those regional strategies to modify existing policies to help the region achieve its goals. 
And those strategies were just approved by the commission and the ABAG executive board for the Plan Barrier 2050 final blueprint in September. We then run the urban sim model and we can summarize the land use pattern and the outcomes for our policymakers. And as I mentioned, this is an iterative process that we went through through our predecessor Horizon initiative in 2018 and 2019. We've done so for the draft blueprint earlier this year, and we're in the process of doing so for the final blueprint right now. So with that context, I'm gonna turn it over to Mike uh, for today's presentation. Thanks, Dave. Um, so as Dave mentioned, I'm going to dive in a little bit more into the technical part of uh, Bay Area Urban Sim 2.0. Um, it's somewhat technical, but we only have, um, you know, half an hour or so. So we're going to keep it kind of um, some of the basics, the fundamentals, and um, that leaves us some time to answer your questions. And that there's usually a lot more detailed questions. We can dig deeper into how the model works, et cetera, either after this or by email later on. Um, and so I'm going to briefly ask the question, why do we forecast land use changes in the Bay Area? Dave's already started to introduce some of those ideas. Um, but what, is, what does it tell us? Why do, why do we use this type of model? Second, I'll do a quick run through of kind of the technical process, what, what Bay Area Urban Sim is, what the steps it goes through, how we think that it tells us, gives us information about what the future of the Bay Area could look like. Uh, and then I'll run through two quick re interrelated examples that give some kind of a um, little bit better understanding of how these things fit together, how the model's used, how, can, how we can use it to answer questions. And then finally, as I mentioned, you'll have hopefully plenty of time for uh, questions at the end. Okay, so first, why forecast within the region? And I think uh, there's a bunch of reasons we want to do this. The um, but the biggest one to, that I, yeah, to me and to, to most of our work is we want to be able to test the effects of regional policies. So we want to ask questions on how a given public policy that we're considering, a proposal, might affect housing, economic development, environmental resilience, or transportation outcomes. And the key thing, I think, with these types of models is a lot of these proposed policies affect through all these different areas. We want to see if a transportation policy impacts housing, et cetera. So that's one of the things that this model helps us answer is kind of these interrelated questions on these policies. And as many of some of you know, we also historically, we use these models to forecast where things grow and how they grow within the region. So we can provide information for local planning. Um, and so we might uh, be able to um, recommend for local planning, what types of policies might be needed to enable a local priority development area to be built out with new homes. Uh, and ultimately, um, we need to do this for, you know, the, uh, the more required reason, perhaps the least interesting in some ways, but we're required to build these uh, detailed maps of future growth patterns, quite, quite as you, most of you know, quite a few decades out, it's kind of a challenge, uh, but we want to know in those future years, 2030, 2040, 2050, where will people live? Where will they work? Where will they shop, et cetera? And we use this for state and federal requirements to conduct analyses, both on where those things are, what, type, what types of land the growth occurs on, but also to feed into our travel model. And that's historically one of the main uses of this type of forecast is to understand where trips in the travel model in that future year start and end and help us better understand our transportation policies and investments. Um, and so this, this is a little bit of a repeat, but I think it's important of a few slides ago, uh, a broad overview of how we forecast change in the region, because there's a lot of parts to it. The title of this, uh, at least the short title, is, is focused mostly on a, a Bay Area urban sim, this one model, but it's part of a process involving multiple steps, multiple models, multiple assumptions. Um, the first step is that we generate a regional growth forecast through 2050 for the total amount of population, households, and jobs. Right, initially, that may sound exactly what I'm saying Urban Sim does, but the key here is that this is, this is a region-wide forecast. We first look at kind of the, the Bay Area in the country or in the world and its economy, things like migration, demographics, and we forecast overall how big will the Bay Area be in the future? Just a challenge in its own. Um, but it's 
region wide, not within the region. Today we're focusing more within the region. Second step is this is it's just just a small step here, but it's it's an amazing amount of work and data collection and, and integration. But we collect everything we can about the state of the region right now, the Bay Area. And one way, it's not not a hundred percent, ninety five percent. This is a, a very detailed map. You can think of it as a very um, carefully made map that um, contains information at the at the individual, you know, specific detailed level of where households of different types are in the region, uh, where different types of jobs are, you know, very much what building are they located in, that kind of detail. Um, all the buildings in the region, uh, you know, uh, where they are, how large they are, when they were built, a lot of detail. So a very, very detailed map. And then I think a key thing is that we also gather information as much as possible. This is an almost endless category of on existing policies. We wanna know what do, um, you know, to some degree, federal, state, regional level, but mostly the local jurisdictions, cities and counties, what types of information do they have about that, that controls or, or uh, promotes or changes how the, their city grows? Um, the most important and kind of easiest to understand example of that, I think, is zoning. Um, how much, what type of thing can be built on a piece of land and how much? How many housing units or how tall can the building be, et cetera? So we, we go through this process of building this very, very detailed map of what we have now as our starting point. Then um, this is where this, this two and three is where Bay Area urban sim starts to fade in, the actual model we bring in these databases as inputs. Then we use existing knowledge on development decisions to predict future choices. And this means that we look to the past, the recent past, different types of behavior in cities. And we try to statistically um, understand that behavior and use that to forecast how the future may work in similar conditions. Um, and so it's a similar process to um, you know most models um, of this sort. Some of you have seen a lot, some of you maybe never, um, economic models forecasting how the economy might grow next year, our travel model forecasting how people make decisions on whether they, they walk or drive, et cetera, in the future. So it's trying to understand based on these decisions, these data sets we have, how does the future work? Four, uh, and this is key, um, I would have bold this, this one entirely because we mostly talk about, you know, um, one through three a lot, but very important is we bring in new strategies. The agency at the, you know, the regional level brings in new strategies or new policies to see how they might affect growth patterns. We bring in, and we, that, that by nature, that means we change some of the existing policies we've co collect, uh, collected and integrated into our data set. We change these to see how we could, we could uh, better achieve our goals that we've stated in our planning process. And finally, we analyze these outcomes to see with these changes added to all this existing knowledge about the region, does it help us achieve our goals? All right, so I'm going to dive in a little in a weird way because um, I think there is a, you know, a very, I think it's a useful, um, I don't know what the right word is, a uh, description, the black box, you know, the model, there is a constant discussion of these models as black boxes, they are complicated. So some of the first things I like to just say is like, what, what is it? Um, is it, you know, a special room? Is it, is it people, people wonder what it looks like? It's, it's a computer program. It's a lot of text. Uh, you can kind of read it. It looks like you can understand it for, you know, many, um, you know, sitting there for a few minutes, then it starts to re you realize it's a lot of little pieces of a computer program. It's not, not as complicated as Excel, but it's got a lot of parts. It's hard to, hard to put it all together at one sitting, but it's, it's um, this piece of data that, um, sorry, data and code that is again used to simulate. It's used to take information, statistical equations, numbers, and put them into simulations or you know, kind of um, probabilistic uh, forecasts. If these types of choices keep occurring in the future, what might the future look like? We get into a little more detail. Um, it simulates things that are very easy to understand in, you know, in most of our daily lives, um, such as people moving to a new home. Most of us have chosen a new home at some point. We think about various things. The, the model tries to capture those things. 
in these, these equations, very you know, kind of generalized version of how different types of people make choices. Um, similarly, less of us have, uh, have uh, experience with this, but how do firms pick new locations? How do businesses pick where to be? It's a kind of a similar process, different things matter than households, obviously, but a similar kind of choice process. And then finally, um, one of the, the interesting parts of this model is that we actually take out a specific firm, real estate developers, um, in this model, we actually look at real estate, you know, for-profit and non-profit developers, and we look at how they make choices in a lot of detail um, based on, and th those, those developers actually interact with the other, other people in the model to build new buildings. And that's how the model moves forward, forecasting how the region changes. Bunch of equations about kind of recent behavior, comparisons, we'll go into a little more depth on some of these. Um, but, you know, it's, it's math within computer code. Um, I think at, at MTC, ABAG, our, our version is, is a highly customized version with a lot of more attention to things like housing, um, resilience, etc. But this is the most commonly used model of, of this type um, in planning in the U.S. and planning in um, globally at this point, I think. So it's a uh, common and Paired with, um, for me, what is very useful is that the, the person that first built this model and designed it and still works on it um, and will talk about it with me, uh, is the nice part, is at UC Berkeley now, um, Paul Waddell. Um, so it's a nice you know, combination of a lot of MPOs and uh, COGS using this model, but also Paul Waddell nearby, which since he's a Berkeley professor, sometimes that doesn't mean I can talk to him all that often, but, but once in a while, I can still find him. Uh, you get it, if you care about these things, it's written in Python, it's a computer language. It's a fairly easy to read computer language compared to other ones. It takes a few hours to run this on a computer um, to do a forecast from today out till 2050. Um, and I think you start to get the idea, it integrates a lot of spatial data. And that's one of the things that's always surprising is most the GIS or mapping data is the large majority of what goes into this model. All right, which segues into uh, the database. I'm just going to make a, do a quick check here. I am not very used to webinars, so I'm going to try to make sure that I'm not getting any essential notifications that I, I'm still on mute, for instance. I don't see any. You're fine, Mike. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> just, I'm looking at my screen and I always get a, I'm not going to notice if, if someone's yelling at me on my screen somewhere. Um, so, uh, I'd much rather have all of you, you know, here in the room, well, not this room, but, uh, you know, one of our rooms at the agency where we could interact, talk, I can see if anyone's asleep yet, etc. But, uh, but I'm going to move on. Um, so we're going to move into the database. And again, this is um, going a little more detail here. Um, we collect information on every parcel of land in the region. Parcel is just the, the word for the legal ownership unit of land. Um, there's 2 million or so pieces of land that are owned within the region. And that, you know, we don't, in the end, we don't care that much about parcels, no, almost not at all, but those are the unit that gets transacted. It gets bought, it gets sold, it gets redeveloped, it gets taxed, it gets, so in terms of government regulation and the way the developers think about building new buildings, parcels are kind of the, the key building block. Um, and so a little, little odd, you know, but again, very close to the real world. I think it's a good, good way to represent it because it's the way people do, do these things in real life. They think about parcels, although most of us in the, in the real world or the, the larger world don't think about parcels that often. Uh, but we have information for all these 2 million parcels on their sizes, their, the value, how much is the land worth, uh, physical constraints like slopes or, or the obvious one is water. We have, we actually, if none of, some of you may have seen, we have parcels that go into the bay um, they're assuming they were going to fill it in. So some of these go in, into the bay. So technically there's some that don't, aren't very good for future development purposes at this point or, or current li living on it. Um, we collect all these from different sources. We have to process them, make sure we get rid of things like those bay parcels. Um, and then finally zoning, um, information that's about what can be done on that parcel uh, by local government. Um, and there's a lot more. These are just kind of the highlights. Uh, the, the types of attributes or characteristics we collect, a lot of these go into the model um, or help with quality control, that type of thing. Uh, every building, which is slightly different, this is getting closer to what we care about, <laughs> is uh, 
Parcels can have no zero buildings or often one single family home on a parcel is the most common building parcel arrangement in the region. But sometimes there can be multiple buildings on a parcel as well. Uh, each of these buildings, we have information on its type. Is it a, is it a single family home? Is it an apartment? Is it a um, power plant? Is it a uh, uh, retail store? Uh, the size, how many square feet? When was it built? What types of materials is the building made out of? Um, and how much is it worth? Uh, what is it worth in today's dollars? Uh, then moving into people, which I think is getting closer to what most of us care about more. Um, we look at every household with the primary, primary characteristic being income quartile. There's a lot of other things that are important about people, but historically for a variety of reasons, the travel model, et cetera, income quartiles is our fundamental unit of thinking about how, what households are like, where they tend to live, how they tend to travel, et cetera. Um, similarly, we look at every job, the location of each job in the region, and we have that arranged by sector, which is a type of industry, um, office versus healthcare versus agricultural, et cetera. Uh, and then we have additional policies. Most of these, uh, some of these are connected to parcels, but they're a little often connected to cities or um, larger areas on things like fees to build buildings, caps on how much can be built within a certain area. Um, etc. that kind of information. It takes a long time. Uh, it's constantly changing. The bulk of it stays the same, you know, every five, 10 years, but a bunch of it changes every, every few uh, months. So we are trying to constantly update this database, keep it relevant. And again, this is what's on the ground now. Um, it's kind of an old map. Uh, I usually make someone try to guess um, where this is because it's a really poor map because there's no title and there's no labels. And there's no, uh, uh, as I used to teach how to make pretty maps, this is, this is not a great map. Um, but the key here is this shows an area because I can't see any of your comments uh, right now. Um, this is near the uh, airport in San Jose. And so the only point here is that we, we zoom in. Each of these, we have parcel information, which are the polygons. We have different uh, characteristics of the buildings, which are the circles of different sizes, which are their commercial. We have the counts of single family or multifamily, which are the numbers you see, et cetera. And a uh, really detailed database, really powerful understanding of the world, incredibly frustrating to build. A um, lot of different data sources go into this, a lot of um, uh, you know com complications due to what year thing, there's lags in different data sets. So we look at all these different factors and we polish up this, this as good as we can get it view of the world today. All right. So now I'm going to step a little bit more in, into the functioning of the model, the area urban sim two, and this is I'm setting it up in a kind of traditional economics way. Um, sometimes that helps, sometimes it doesn't. Depends on your background. It's not essential. It's not, and it's not really. It's econ, an economic model, but it's not strictly tied to, to economics. Most economists would not like how this model works. There's a lot of other types of thinking in it, if you will. But I will start with this idea of there's a demand for buildings. And again, I'm restating things I said earlier about how households make choices for where they want to live, et cetera. But if we say it a little more formally, um, what we're doing when we run Urban Sim is that through this forecast into future years, we're taking a bunch of households. There's, we have households in, each, in most of the housing units. And then every few years, we get another round from that external forecast, we get additional households that are moving into the Bay Area. And so we have um, both households that are moving in that are considered without a home at that point. And we have uh, households that had a home but decide to move every few years. So we simulate when people choose to move and the arrival of these new home households. And then we use recent behavior on how different types of households choose where they wanna live based on characteristics of the neighborhood and the residential building. So um, larger households prefer larger um, uh, build, uh, homes. Um, wealthier households are able to pay for more expensive homes. Uh, people of particular type, income category, presence of children, those types of things, depending if you're working or not working. Uh, the characteristic of where the neighborhood is located may be important long list of different things. We try to fi find the most important things about these choices in recent years. And we, they have to be things that we can understand in the recent past, but also things, these inputs that we can model into the future. 
we think about how the region changes and we use the, these very micro models to, to simulate a, a whole bunch of households in urban sim and place them in new buildings. They're essentially moving into new homes based on the types of household they are and what those types of households have done in the past. And we see in this a little bit of economics, the place there are certain places where more, more households want to live than there is housing available. And so in those places, housing prices go up. And so Palo Alto, there's X number of homes. Um, a lot of people like Palo Alto, for instance, the prices go way up. Um, that's, that's an economic concept. It's not, a, it's not as strict as in some economic models in our model. It's just a, a, a tendency, if you will. Um, and I'm, I focus on households because everybody understands it better, as I mentioned, and most of the, the interest and discussion is about households, but firms are very similar. I can talk some other time about that. Uh, businesses choosing where to locate. They want, they want to be in places, both these households and these firms have demand for buildings in particular locations. The opposite side of this in Bay Area Urban Sim is that there is a supply of buildings. The, the amount of buildings that are available for these households and firms to locate in. Um, and so in the beginning, I just detailed how the current supply of buildings is the map of now. What are all the buildings? How big are they? What types of buildings are they? Where are they? Um, as the region grows through the forecast, Barrier Urban Sim simulates the constructions of new building, construction of new buildings on both vacant and occupied land, greenfield and increasingly in our region, um, infill land. Um, and the model does this using what's called a pro forma, which is an odd, an odd choice of words, but it's, it's actually comes from uh, real estate development and it's from what I've observed, uh, it's exactly the same tool that many developers use to understand um, a potential real estate development project into the future. So they wanna understand what it would cost them to build a certain type of building, a new apartment building on this piece of land uh, relative to its costs. What would it cost me to, to do the building, to buy the land, um, to, to finish the planning process, et cetera, over X number of months, it might take five months, it might take five years. And so it's a, it's a, a spreadsheet in usual life when it's a developer that they go around and they look at sites and then they, they cost them out this way to understand if there's a potential to build a building for them to make a profit, which I'm not super interested in myself, but that's how most buildings still get built. So we wanna understand how they, you know, how they go about this business of an understanding the existing world, the constraints like zoning and how they, under the constraints, their constraints of financial feasibility, can they build something here? So in urban sim, we actually simulate 2 million of these every, every round into the future. We have we do these spreadsheets it's in, in Python, it's pretty fast. We just look again and again and again, can, could, could this developer build something in a place where they could make profit? Um, this includes more detail, just a little deeper. There's a lot of things that go into a pro forma. Some of you have probably done these or they can go on for pages in, in Excel. Um, but it, the key things are how much does it cost to tear down any existing buildings and prepare the site? That's quite different in different places. Uh, empty lot versus a car dealer versus a fairly nice apartment building versus a very expensive mansion. All of those have different costs if they wanna start and build something else there. And that very much affects what can happen in that place. How much uh, is it going to cost to build a new building of a particular size and height, materials, construction, loans to get those things, et cetera? And how much income might this project generate once complete? What could they sell this new apartment building for? What could they, what is this new retail uh, establishment worth? Can they make a profit combining these costs and these, um, uh, this uh, income they will get eventually when they finish the project? And so that combines together into a forecast process, which in the Bay Area, we do five-year increments in Bay Area Urban Sim, and we simulate the demand step, then the supply step on these previous slides. We move through them, and the model interacts in that way, which is, again, a black box. There's, there's some submodels I haven't mentioned. There's, there's a you know, fair amount of math. There's things that are you know, harder to um, make clear. But this is very, compared, compared to some of the other older models, this is fairly easy to understand. It's, it's fairly like the real world. Um, we can say, do we do a good job? Um, we can ask a question, is it a good job of simulating the real world? Um, we can argue about that, certainly. Uh, 
it's hard to do. Um, but then at least the process here, the goal is to make it, you know, for two reasons, the goal is to make it, it mimic the real world, both um, because we think that is a better way to forecast how the city changes and get the, the right, the best answers about how the future might look and how policies might change that future, especially. Um, but then second, this approach also allows me to explain it a little easier than if it truly were a black black box that was very hard to understand. Um, so this way, we we'll move through these steps and we generate a future regional development pattern that integrates this growth with what's existing on the land right now. Um, so this moves into the next step in our, in our overall regional um, use of, of, of Bay Area Urban Sim and our approach to forecasting. And this is the introduction of regional strategies, which are often policies, but sometimes they're a little broader than that idea. Um, and again, to, to restate, Bay Area Urban Sims 2 starts by assuming local policies, such as zoning, constrain what can be built everywhere in the region. The model doesn't, you know, doesn't matter what urban sim computes, et cetera, the, you know, but the zoning in every city main, you know, is the limit as to what that pro forma can consider. The developer, the fake developer in the model can't think about other options. They have to fit in, that, in those constraints as created by local policy. And so, however, we at the, at the agencies, MTCA bag, we do change some of these policies based upon our approved regional strategies. We're trying to think as a region, um, trying to achieve certain goals. And so in certain places, we modify those base constraints and then the model works the same way, but within different constraints and can produce a different building that wouldn't be possible under the local constraints. So for Plan Barrier 2050, we had 35 strategies guiding future growth. Uh, again, probably the most important for most of our discussion is allowable uses. Can residential be here? Can commercial be here? And densities, how many, how many housing units, how tall can the building be within what's called our growth geographies, the areas of particular areas in the region that we felt were of regional interest where we did change some of these policies in order to achieve a different future distribution, a different map of where housing and jobs might be. Other more detailed um, policies we added were inclusionary or changed and added were inclusionary housing requirements, the, the requirement to build deed restricted low income units. When a for-profit developer builds uh, market rate units, you have to build perhaps 10% of them as for low income households in perpetuity. Um, we, we model that. Um, subsidies for affordable housing and strategically identified locations. Similar idea. These are a few of the different policy changes within these 35 major strategies. M many of you have seen this. This is just a stolen slide from a general approach to what we're doing here, the types of things we're looking at. I think it's very important. Uh, I'm not going to talk about it. This is what guides us in uh, the changes we make within the model system. Similarly, stolen slide. Um, where are our, our growth geographies, our priority areas? We make changes in the more colorful areas in this map to zoning, for instance. And then urban sim works within that context. Uh, this slide is pretty boring, um, but what comes out, a bunch of maps, if you will, of the future, a lot of summary tables, a lot of detailed information, a lot of information by jurisdiction, as Dave mentioned, um, information for the travel model, uh, more, more detailed by my neighborhood, if you will, what does the future look like? And we can assess these to see whether we're making progress toward our regional goals um, and also to you know, move, it, move it into the travel model for future analysis. I think also, you know, uh, I think I'm doing okay in about, maybe I'll try to wrap up in four minutes. So I'm gonna go a little quick here and, and um, uh, to just have two quick examples. Uh, and they're interrelated, oh, three minutes. Uh, so one time question. So use case number one is what do we, you know, jump into what do we do? You know, what types of questions do we ask? How does the model answer them? Um, there's a lot of different things. This is, some of you will find these kind of uh, help understand kind of what the type of thing we do, what the, how the model reacts. Um, again, we can talk later. I'll have, I can have other examples at other, other times. Um, but uh, one of the things we want, we, our long range plans, we've historically been interested in um, increasing transit ridership almost always. We want to improve the return, we want more riders on transit, uh, expensive systems, um, 
and we want to reduce green, greenhouse gas emissions more recently uh, has been a goal. So key strategies um, that come out of our planning process to try to approach that, we take those from the planning process and then we put them into Barry Urban Sim and analyze them. Um, so Barry Urban Sim doesn't give us much guidance as to how to do this best. Um, and, you know, especially considering all the other factors, equity, cost, political feasibility, et cetera. Um, but we put these, we come up with some ideas, we put them in, common changes are we might, and we do in PBA 50, we might allow multifamily residential and locations near transit stations in, in places where it's not allowed in local, in local plans. We might also increase the allowable, res, allowable residential density near these transit stations to two of the most common fundamental things we're doing here. So Bay Area Urban Sim takes those things, it doesn't make any immediate judgments. Uh, is this a good idea or a bad idea? Uh, but we just rerun the thing and it reruns to spe specifically these real estate developer pro formas, which are directly impacted by most of these, these subsidies. It's mostly changes the supply side of the process. We calculate whether developer can make a profit building infill at that location. Um, and then, you know, we're doing this is what we're doing normally. What, how does it work? As we, uh, then we can see with these changes, these modified levels, based on everything else that's there, what's the neighborhood like, et cetera, all the old stuff, we can calculate a shift. Do we get more housing to move toward these locations? Um, we get you know, we get very precise. We get 12,000 more units in these places within a half mile of transit. And the model forecasts that and says, with our understanding of the data, what's there now, plus the policy, plus feasibility, this is what could happen. And then we move those into the travel model and say, uh, what kind of greenhouse gas changes does that get us? Um, in that way, we can answer these questions. Do we, are we making progress? Would that type of policy change or that strategy help us to achieve what we want in the, at the regional level, this decrease in, um, or increase in transit use, decrease in greenhouse gas emissions? Very typical case, a more sophisticated, we've added on a lot of customization to ask us, you know, what's next when we, we try that question. We're also interested in the households that occupy these new infill units. And in typical cases that, you know, many people have brought up in, in, as activists in the literature, et cetera, that the housing's new. Um, we want more housing, but it is also new. New housing is often more expensive. It is often occupied by wealthier households because it's more expensive. Um, and so we, we find that we can see those impacts in Bay Area Urban Sim 2. And then we can also add additional policies to try to mitigate. We still want to, we want to meet our first goal but we also want to mitigate these changes, this displacement of lower income households by modeling what's called inclusionary zoning, I mentioned a bit back, or, or some other process, but that's a, a common one right now. Uh, and that's a strategy that requires this, this for-profit developer, the one we're relying on to build the units, the, the additional apartments or condos originally, we put a, a form of a tax on them, say, oh, 15, 20% of them have to be deed restricted low income. And the model is, does a fairly sophisticated job of, of um, saying, okay, some of them just get built and then we have these deed restricted units in place and we can measure, did people, you know, is there less displacement? Did we have, to what degree did that help achieve our goal? We may also find that if the requirement's high that the, the, the units no longer pencil out, they no longer are profitable um, and then the developer goes elsewhere. So we may want to accept that as accept, okay or we may want to lower the inclusionary amount. Uh, we can try to tune our idea of the policy and so that's the kind of thing we ask. There's, this is a small snippet of all the different things we're asking. A lot of them interrelate with each other, which is pretty frustrating. Um, change A and it changes something else in a different category of, of, of goal. Um, but that's the way cities work. Um, so I think that you know, the use of a fairly complex, sophisticated model, model with a large database and a fair amount of understanding about how we think these things interact helps us to answer these types of questions. Um, and so in conclusion, um, our process is going to want to reiterate, mostly repeating things uh, that I've already said maybe two or three times sometimes. We collect a lot of info what's on the ground. And that's, that's a lot of the work is just what's going on right now. We want to understand that very well. There's a lot of reasons to want to know that. But it's certainly if you're going to think about the future, you want to know what's happening today. Uh, we gather a lot of information on local policies. And these constrain most of what ends up growing in the region overall, even in our final plan that those policies matter quite a bit. And then we modify exist, these existing policies within with our strategies and the growth geographies 
in fairly small areas, or at least the areas with the large, the largest modifications are fairly small compared to the rest of the region as a whole, to shift toward regional out outcomes, and we move toward, hopefully, toward our regional goals. And so together, in summary, Bay Area Urban Sim 2 forecasts this future growth pattern, combining a bunch of different things. And every time we want to know, you know we want to pull it apart or get, uh, if we're angry about part of it or if we like part of it, we want to try to remember that all these pieces matter. The regional trends, how, what's the region doing as a whole, this current map of the world today, what's there already, and that limits us sometimes. What are the local policies and constraints for what can happen there? Where did we change those constraints to meet our, you know, our future regional strategies? And then this is all within a, a framework of financial feasibility. Will, will um, developers be able to build within in this, uh, this framework? Will, the, will, the, will these policies actually drive urban growth and thus the location of households and firms in the ways that we think they will? And that's all I have for today. Um, uh, but now we'd like to hear some questions. And I also have uh, my email and Dave's email up here. Um, so today, uh, we'd love to hear anything, more detailed questions, future, um, um, God, I forgot what it's called, Zoom, Zoom uh, meetings, discussions, you know, um, I can just jump into any kind of area in the future. Limited time today, but really appreciate you taking the time to listen. Thanks. Great, Mike. Thank you so much. Delightful is the thing that comes to mind for me. Very good. We have many, many questions. So what I'm going to do is go through the questions that directly relate to Urban Sim. And um, we'll do as many as we have time for. And uh, I encourage you, for those who aren't able to get your questions answered, I would request that you send an email to info at planbaria.org. And staff is happy to answer questions that aren't um, we're not able to answer today. So first question, what's the smallest spatial geography for existing and forecasted 2050 household jobs population? Is it at the parcel level? And I think that's you, Mike. All right, get my, get my okay. <laughs> desk here is full. Um, uh, the smallest level, well, honestly, the smallest level right now is the the unit. We put um, we put households into units, and um, actual housing units, which can be a single family home and as a building, or multiple units within a a uh, multifamily building, and we put jobs into um, buildings. And so technically, yeah, we, we have this very micro um, packing of uh, households and jobs into these spaces. And um, to some degree that provides us with understanding, but to some degree, we don't, we don't, you know, we don't understand that we, we don't understand the, the deep that much detail, but there is a little, there is a, an amount of, I guess, bean counting here. Like we, we have slot, slots, you know, how many, one of the most important questions we're asking is how many housing units are there and you know can we fit this many households in them so technically we do match households to individual units um but when it gets to questions about the size of the unit and that type of thing and um overcrowding for instance or something we're um we're limited a lot on data and our understanding of what's happening so it's so we we do zoom way in but some of the best questions to be asked about that we don't understand very well i guess i'd say um, other levels like the neighborhood, we understand much better, I guess I should say. So like a few blocks of the city, um, how many people are there, what types of people, um, that's the thing, that's the sweet spot that we're really aiming to understand at the regional level. Um, a few, you know, thousand or 2000 neighborhoods. Um, and that's kind of what we really hope to understand, but the model does zoom in for kind of technical detail. Okay, thank you. Next question, um, clarifying question on slide two. Overview of forecasting change. Do you include data collection on land, land use, and landscaping? Uh, Sorry, I'm trying to get to the slide. Where? Two. There we go. Uh, Sorry, could you repeat the, the actual list of things? Land? Land use and landscaping. Uh, yeah, we collect a lot of data on land and land use. Um, I'm not sure what you mean by landscaping exactly, but, um, but we do, yeah, we're constantly collecting information about what everybody's doing with each piece of land, um, whether most of that in our interest being 
buildings, um, but some of it being um, agricultural agricultural uses or other things. Um, I'm not sure I'm answering that that well, but. Uh, Okay, thank you. Next question. This is a, an interesting question from most of us. For most of us, if the model captures every building, does it include my house? <laughs> that is a great question. Um, uh, very likely. <laughs> it's, uh, um, but then, uh, you know, it's it's, um, yeah, very likely. We we have quite a bit of data at this point um, from a lot of different sources. And, you know, depending what your house is like, if it's, you know, if it's more of the rental end, we have it from a commercial database. If it's more of an ownership unit, we have it from the county assessor. Um, and so we have a lot of, uh, of data about how big it is, how old it is. Um, and most of it is, um, I'd say 99% of it is, it's correct. It's the right data and it's the right place. Uh, but there are some, you know, big mistakes. And so it's always a little embarrassing, you know, any, uh, you know, I'll bet with most of anyone to, <laughs> if we want to check one, um, but our only real goal is to make sure we get the gist of it correct. Um, and so for that, there are in every block or so or every neighborhood, there are a few buildings we have to um, fill in the details. Um, they don't, um, it, the record is incomplete, etc. So we do um, fill in some extra information. So we have a lot, surprising amount, but there are holes in it. And so we, we, again, we're trying to make sure that you know, how many people, what type of people live on a block or so is, um, is correct. In any given building, you never know. And I've, I've checked all the ones I've lived in and most of them were okay. Okay, thank you. Next question, I'm gonna, from Roland, I'm gonna combine a couple. So collect data, how? Is it possible to get a shape file on the data, size, value, zoning, et cetera, that UrbanSim used for my jurisdiction and are the sources for each data point available in the metadata? Well, Ursula, I'm going to take the first half of this one and I'll turn it over to Mike on the metadata question. So uh, as was mentioned in the presentation, UrbanSim uses data from the BASIS initiative, which collected data from a wide variety of sources uh, on existing parcels and zoning and all of that. Um, local jurisdictions across the region had a window in 2019 for a number of months to review this basis data used in the uh, urban sim modeling. Um, so local jurisdictions across the region do have access to that information. Um, and if you're if you're not a local jurisdiction, uh, if you have questions about basis, we do encourage you to reach out to the basis team uh, at basis at bayareametro.gov. You want me to talk about metadata? That's the most boring part. Um, yeah, we try to keep a record of how we've combined things. Uh, some of it's a little hard to, to piece out, um, but yeah, we try to we try to understand that. And we we're generally trying to keep the data as open as we can, but we are limited by um, at least three things: um, that that the data sets are quite large. Um, the second being some of it, unfortunately, is proprietary. We're trying not to avoid that, but we we have to purchase some data. Um, and we can't we can't reshare it. Um, and then third, uh, right to the, the metadata point, which is just that some of it, you know, we we don't we don't have a great list of. Um, if you really want to dig into all the detail, it's pretty. Uh, we don't have a great data dictionary yet. Um, so we're we're working with basis on that uh, that effort. Great, thank you. Uh, next question from Elise: What if we don't have the data? Does that mean you don't have the data? Ah. Uh, Mm, no, <laughs> it's a, I don't. I don't know who you who you are, or how you might have it. But if uh, there's a chance, I you know we we've we I scour around for data. So um, sometimes we have better data than cities, for instance. I'm, I'm not trying to be difficult. Uh, uh, but you know, there's a lot of data we don't have, and a lot of it's wrong. And, uh, uh, so it was a pretty broad question, but I. Uh, um, well, there's an example I, I did not include, which I will. Like Marin County Assessor doesn't track the units on nonprofit sites like the University of Redlands. If that uh, so, uh, you know, again, I, I, in my head, I have the master database, which is perfect. Is, uh, you know, I think about it all the time. Um, but it's like a planner, weird planner uh, fixation. Uh, but, uh, you know, so we, with things like that, you know, we, we, we triangulate, I guess, we, so we, we grab every, all the data sets we can, and we assume that they're all missing things, which they, they all are. Um, and then we we try to understand what's missing. So we do rely a lot on the census or other very boring counts for neighborhoods. How many units should be in 
um, the south side of Berkeley uh, campus, for instance. And then, you know, we put that zone, which is a bunch of blocks over there. And I have, you know, I have a count. How many housing units should there be? How many group quarters should there be? And then I look at kind of what we have in the, in the, the assessor's data, for instance, and we, you know, we often are missing things. Um, and so we do a combination of first going through and trying to fill in other data sets. So if we can find information on deed restricted low income housing, there's some others that are useful. And honestly, with universities, I've mostly gone in, you know, manually over the years and built um, databases of all the dorms, for instance, um, and um, actually all the buildings for the larger universities. Um, so we kind of keep that as a separate record um, and then keep these larger controls to make sure, you know, to try to try to zoom in anywhere where we think we're missing data. And we get a lot of it. We get eight, over 85% everywhere, maybe higher most places. And then in some places we, we, um, we assume that there's a few more units that we haven't found. We, it was called imputing. Um, so I think that's a, um, it's a, it's an odd process. We have a few big data sets, but we, you know, I guess the short answer would be, I'm, I'm, I very much know that the assessor is missing a lot of information. That's kind of our starting point. Then we go through this kind of search everywhere and try to find everything. And then at the end, does it all add up? Do we think we're missing things? And we try to uncover those things, I guess, through the process. Great. Right, here's another question somewhat similar from Pierce. How can a local jurisdiction confirm the data inputs and assumption used in urban sim for an individual jurisdiction? The change from the jurisdiction projections in Plan Barrier 2040 to the Blueprint 2050 RENA export is so dramatic, it could suggest to the public that mistakes in the inputs have been made. Well, so Dave, let me... will jump, Dave will jump in and say, yeah. with basis, you've, you've had a chance to review it. Um, it'd be good to keep reviewing it. Um, and I'm sorry, Dave, to cut you off, but I'd also say, uh, re remember in, in what I've just said, though, there's all these other things that matter too. So the inputs do matter, but we also change strategies quite a bit. Sorry, Dave, go ahead. Yeah, yeah, Mike, I think you covered the key points there, which is we have uh, ideally better baseline data than in the past, but also different strategies. So in the past, let's say your city had no priority development areas in the past. Well, in Plan Barrier 2040, you wouldn't have seen a lot of growth. Uh, this cycle, if your local jurisdiction has not nominated some of those key areas that are essential to a deal with racial equity, to deal with climate change, those areas have been adopted as growth geographies in the plan and additional zoning capacity has been identified in those places. That can lead to the projections being quite a bit, quite a bit different for jurisdictions that maybe uh, weren't uh, uh, nominating priority development areas in the past. Great, thank you. Uh, next question from Grace. Does urban sim automatically take into consideration increased densities and streamlined development allowed by state legislation? For example, for example, state density bonus, SB 35 were applicable in SB 288, et cetera. Uh, it often does. Also, you know, it, we do our best to stay on top of the way that those, those types of bonuses work. Um, sometimes if they're new, we have to devise slightly um, less sophisticated ways of representing those things. Uh, they're not exactly, you know, the model, our, our version is, you know, highly customized already, on, especially in this housing area. And yet the legislation often finds new ways to kind of come up with um, possibly very effective bonuses, hopefully, um, or changes. We try our best to get those things in as, as we can, but honestly, some of them, we, we get the gist of it in. Um, that this is um, decrease the cost by 2% in this, in this type of unit in this type of area. Um, so we're, we're close, I think, but we, um, we're not aiming, you know, I, I brought up the pro forma. Um, you will see a developer that goes out with a pro forma has to, those, those new laws are make or break for those developers. They could very much change the feasibility of a project we can't do that. We're looking at the 2 million parcels. And so we're trying to get the gist of it right um, because it is a regional model. And we think you know, if, it, if it changes the regional distribution of where growth will go, uh, it helps to get more infill of a particular type. We very much try to capture that, but, but you couldn't use our, our it's, it is sometimes not detailed enough to you know, do that site level. Um, am I gonna make profit? Is you gotta, we, we can't get every factor just right. Um, over time, we get better, but especially if they're new, we're not, we're not perfect. Okay. 
Next question uh, from Liz. How does urban sim characterize natural lands and the resources and benefits contained in those natural lands? Oh, uh, I can I say first, you know, I, urban sim doesn't, you know, doesn't, doesn't characterize like, um, I have worked, you know, Stanford has a model called, I shouldn't, I guess it's, uh, I know Stanford and some partners have a model called invest, I think. Um, and uh, there are models that, that try very much to do that directly. Urban sim is mostly about the urban side. So it is about trying to, to think about how people, firms and, and developers work. And so we represent um, the outputs of those, those processes involving natural lands. So to, that's the, the, the bulk of it. So we have urban growth boundaries in urban sim. We, we avoid, we don't develop on wetlands. We, we can pick any class of land that we have decided to for a policy to, to take out of the development process or to, to put a fee on it and make it more expensive. Uh, and urban sim is, for instance, very good at figuring out whether a fee or a tax would slow down the destruction of a particular set of, of natural features. But, but urban sim itself does not figure out what the land is worth for other uses. That's kind of like a, a, you know, a, a sister model, if you will, or a, or a broader, you know, ideally a broader planning process that uses analytics and other, other um, inputs to arrive at what's important for protection. So just to be clear, you know, urban sim uh, brings those things in and considers them in the planning process, but doesn't, doesn't deal with them directly or explicitly. Okay, we have one minute left. So, um... Again, I'll, I'll ask those of you who did not get your questions answered, and we're very sorry we ran out of time, but um, uh, please uh, send those to info at planbayarea.org. Um, I will go to Roland's question. How, where did BAUS collect zoning constraints per parcel, max height, max um, density, et cetera, is from the jurisdiction's response and basis? Um, yeah, so we've, um, one thing is that we the regional agencies have been collecting um, Kind of uh, jurisdiction in jurisdictional information on allowable uh, growth and type and amount for a few decades now, and so we we have historic data sets, um, and in the last few plans we've collected some some data, and then basis is an effort to update those those historical data sets. So it's a rolling process of collecting this information, and um, but yeah, it is in every case it has. You know, as far as I know, the only way to do it is to go to the jurisdiction and ask them for their information and collect, which is, you know, I'm saying this because it's a very time consuming process um, on everybody's part, I think, you know, we have to get the data from them. And then just we, we go ahead and we tr create a, a unified database. So everybody uses a slightly different set of terminologies and um, uh, descriptions, etc. And we bring those different ones together and combine them into a single system that, that misses some of the nuance, but keeps the, the key details at the regional level. So, you know, we, we have three or four, four types of residential buildings. A, a particular jurisdiction might have 28 types. And we, we put those 28 into our four types. You know, is it a, is it a multifamily, single family, a row house, mixed use? Those are the four types. Um, and so, um, we do that, you know, by going to ask them, gathering their data, and then boiling it down, um, simplifying it to some degree. So, because every every jurisdiction has a different um, schema or you know set of terms or ways to talk about it. So yeah, we we do go out to each one. We've done it a new, you know numerous times in the past. It's become a little bit more regularized and um, a little bit more quantitative in the in recent years. Um, and then we, we bring that into a unified database um, because, you know, nobody, as far as we know, nobody else has done this kind of pre, pre processing. The only place to really get an understanding of those site level um, constraints is to go straight to the jurisdiction's um, information. Okay. Thank you. Thanks very much. Thank you so much to Mike. Thank you, Dave. Um, and thanks to all of you who participated on behalf of MTC ABAG. Um, that's a wrap. And uh, again, I'll say it one more time. Please send any unanswered questions to info at planbayarea.org and staff will respond um, to your questions. Um, thank you and have a lovely afternoon.